Take your Bible, if you would. Good to be here tonight. And uh, I did. I, they had a cup on sale over at Planet Overstock. So I thought, ah, I better get that. This one won't spill out all over the carpet. Okay? Yeah. Yay! So... And of course, Sister Helen had to say, that's just like my grandchild's cup. He's three. Thanks. Listen, if I have it in my hand, I'm going to drop it. I'm just, it's got to be a safety cup or, yeah, safety cup. Not sippy cup. Safety. Safety. Acts chapter one. Turn there or go home. That song uh, we were singing tonight, I was saying amen and listened to some of the verses there. Uh, the arm of flesh will fail you, ye dare not trust your own, something like that. Um, our flesh will fail us, guaranteed, 100% guaranteed. That man that called me... Uh, week before last, to try to set me up using Scripture, isolating Scripture in a context that it doesn't belong in. And that is one of the signs of a false prophet. They will, um, they'll pretend that their, their ideas come from Scripture. Uh, and sometimes what they'll do is if, if they're writing something out, They'll tell you some kind of false doctrine and they'll print next to it maybe three or four or five scripture references that they say backs up what, what false doctrine they have. And I learned this studying the methods of Finnis Dake. Dake was crazy. He was out of his mind. Um... And all kinds of things that I won't mention tonight. But anyway, um, he, that was his modus operandi. He would write out, he wrote, he wrote a book. Uh, he wrote notes on the whole Bible. And uh, you, can, you can get a copy of Dake's Annotated Reference Bible. And it's got the Bible in it, but it's got Dake's notes all around it. And uh, he'll make these outrageous statements. I'll give you an example. In Genesis chapter 2, Dake's notes say that, uh, he says, most people believe that it did not rain before the flood happened. However, the scriptures are clear in that it did rain before the flood. What? What? And he references this verse out of Genesis 2. When you read it, you're going, it doesn't say that. And then he puts, you know, he peppers it with four or five other scriptures in the Bible. And you go to those, he's counting on you to be lazy and not go to those verses and check him out. When you go to those verses, you see that it has absolutely nothing to do with his theory that it did rain before the flood. And everybody else is wrong and I'm right. And so once, once I figured out that that's the way he does a lot of his false doctrine, then it was easy to, to just pick him out and say, okay, he says this, but he gives all these verses, but those verses don't say anything about it. Rather, the contrary, I can show you five or six places where you're an idiot and you're wrong. Um, and his, whole, his major theory that he left behind when he died was he believed that you are saved until you sin. When you sin after salvation, you have lost your salvation and you must repent and to get it back. And uh, I didn't know what that doctrine was called. Now, I called Mike Hudson one time, asked him about it, and he said, yeah, that's called repeated regeneration. That every time you sin, you lose your salvation and you need to confess that sin and repent of it. And God will then uh, forgive you once again and save you all over again. And uh, his doctrine matches Mormon doctrine, 
when he says that, um, that once you are forgiven of a sin, if you go back and commit that same sin again, God unforgives the first time you did it, and now he's going to hold both of them against you. Which itself is dumb, because how many sins does it take to condemn a person to an eternity of hell? One. So, I don't know where he gets that, but Mormons believe that same thing. I've read it in the, uh, somewhere in the Doctrine and Covenants. And some of the statements by whatever apostle is living now in Salt Lake City. Uh, but that's what they believe. That once you commit a sin and, and God forgives it, then you're forgiven until you go back and do it again. And God unforgives the first time. Now you're guilty of two sins. And it's really, God's really going to come down on you. And um, I, I think it's just better if we trust what the Bible says. That for we are saved by grace through faith. And that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And Finistake definitely boasted of the fact that he believed that uh, salvation was equal to bodily healing. And if you ended up with a sickness that afflicted your body, and you did not by faith eliminate that sickness from your body, then you are not saved. You're not truly saved. And he said that every Christian should die the way Moses did. 120 years, full life force, no sickness, no disease, nothing. He just died. And that's how he's going to die. But that's not how he died. He didn't make it to 120 years. He ended up with Parkinson's disease, which takes years to kill you. So you would figure if he's right... Surely, in the three or four years that Parkinson's disease was slowly eating away the stuff in his brain, that surely he would have enough faith to rid himself of that disease and die then of natural causes. But he didn't. The last six months of that person's life is filled with agony and pain and suffering, and they have no control over their bodily functions at all. It's a horrible, horrible way to die. And I think God gave that to him as a sign to everybody that's smart that will look at that and say, you know what? He's a liar. Because if he's not, even he didn't have enough faith to die of natural causes. And so if Dake couldn't do it, you can't either. Amen? All right. Uh, Acts chapter 1. Uh, I've got some... I, I know I'm carrying this same theme again but i got some really really deep good stuff to show you all right so we're looking at what uh jesus said in verse five for john truly baptized with water but you shall be baptized with the holy ghost not many days hence and we know what uh, uh john the baptist himself said that uh, i truly have baptized you with water under repentance but there's one coming after me whose shoe latchets I'm unworthy to lose or shoes I'm unworthy to bear is, is what he says in one gospel. And um, uh, he says, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And I think that there is a clear break in that Christ did at this time and this outpouring of the Holy Spirit baptize everybody with the Holy Ghost. And I believe that coming in the last days, um, there is going to be a baptism of fire. But let me, say it, let me say it like this. I don't think God waits until the last days with many of us, in fact, all of us who are sincere about our faith, love the Lord, and love our, love our Bible, love Jesus, love the Christian way of life, uh, definitely with the connection that I'm going to try to make tonight is that um, all of us are going to have times when devils are going to try us, try our faith, uh, try uh, the doctrines that we believe in. Uh, the Bible says, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Uh, there are some doctrines that people might come up with, but when you examine them in scripture and when you look at the example of people in the Bible and you look at your own life for an example, you find out that no, that's not true. 
That's not true. And so you easily reject doctrines that the Bible doesn't back up. Uh, the testimony of people in the scriptures don't back it up. And um, you have never seen anything like that in your life, in your past before. Um, um, so I believe that there are times we are baptized with fire. And I'll show you that as we go along. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask the Lord for your blessings tonight uh, on this teaching. Lord, guide my thoughts, Lord, so that I can convey uh, the things, Lord, that I believe that you've put into my spirit. Uh, Father, I thank you for the gift of this Bible, Lord, in that uh, even as a child, we can believe what the scripture said. Just like Timothy, who as a child, he was dedicated to the holy scriptures and they made him wise into salvation. And so, Father, uh, I pray, dear God, that everybody hearing my voice tonight, from a child on up to the oldest one, Father, they could hear the wonderful things of the word of God Lord, that we could all learn something from it tonight, that you would just bless your word and teach us things that we need to know. Father, we live in perilous days, but it's not as bad as it's going to be. And so, Father, prepare us for those days that are coming when the real baptism by fire takes place. Father, we trust in you. We ask you to bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 13. I'm not going to go back and take the time to revisit some things that we've already looked at. I really need to move forward here on this. Ezekiel chapter 13, um, speaking of people like Finnis Dake and so on, for some reason, that I can't get that fan to blow on me. I think it's blowing all, Derek is stealing all of my air. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 13 uh, if you want to jot this down, Ezekiel 13 and Ezekiel, I believe, 24, both have a similar theme in them in that they mention a wall that is built with untempered... No, it's... Um, let's see here. It's, I believe it's 34. I, it is. It's Ezekiel 34. Uh, where God mentions that they're building with untempered mortar. And um, Brother George uh, Chance would know about this. My son Matthew, he worked at the, uh, the lime kiln uh, for a while. And uh, he learned all this. They dig that lime uh, out of that cave there. They said they got enough lime to last them another hundred years. That's quite a bit of lime. And so they dig that lime that that raw lime out of that mountainside there and out of that cave, but you can't use it the way it is. That has got to go through the fire of change. It's got to go through a transformation. And so they take that lime and they, they put that into an oven, a kiln, and they heat it up. I don't know what, exactly what temperature they heat it up to, but it changes the molecular structure of that lime so that when it comes out, when you add water to that, you've basically made cement, is what you've made. That lime will stick, and it'll hold, uh, you, when you are going to use, make it into mortar, you add that, and you add some river sand, and so on, and that sand will hold together, and hold, and, and be turned into mortar, it'll hold bricks on a wall for a hundred years or longer. Uh, it'll hold stones onto a wall. It'll hold things together. It's that kind of glue. And um, so when you have untempered mortar, you have, uh, let's put it in, in this light. You have doctrines that have not passed the test of being run through the fire. It's things that are made up by preachers. Or, I'll say it like this, it's things that are made up by devils. Uh, I counseled a young man today on the phone, and I, I covered some of this. Um, how the Bible uh, talks about doctrines of devils and seducing spirits. And those doctrines that are all over the internet, and people are just latching on to them. But if they try to build a wall of faith out of it, if they try to build their life on that, 
It may look like it's stuck together, but one of these days, something's going to happen and that wall's going to come down. And it, it, there's just nothing holding it together. And God, God says it in no uncertain terms in these two passages. Basically, the untempered mortar is, you're saying things that you say God said, but God says, I never said them. They didn't come out of my mouth. They're, I didn't give it to the prophets. They're not written down anywhere by anybody that got it from me. And so it's make-believe doctrine or it's, it's a doctrine that's come out of hell. In Ezekiel 13 verse 9, the Bible says, Mine hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity. You know what a prophet that sees vanity? It's them, it's them uh, TBN preachers that always have their hand out. And they're always going to give you their address and tell you where you can mail your checks or where you can uh, send your credit card information to or how you can send it online to such and such and thus and thus. And, uh, they, and, and they are living proof that this doctrine works because they are filthy rich. And if you want to be filthy rich like God wants you to be, in fact, that's the gospel right there. If the gospel, and I heard a guy say this. If your gospel does not make you rich, you've got the wrong gospel. Yeah. So God says, my hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and that divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people. Neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel. Neither shall they enter into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord God. Because even because they have seduced my people. Remember what Paul said, seducing spirits. They have seduced my people. Saying peace, and there was no peace. And one built up a wall, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. They used lime all right. If that lime hadn't been through the fire. Its molecular structure remains unchanged. Therefore, it is not going to hold together. And so in verse 11, he says, Say unto them which daub it with untempered mortar, it shall fall. There shall be an overflowing shower, and ye all great hailstones. Now remember that. Because the first four trumpets deal with fire from heaven, hailstones, and so on. All great hailstones shall fall, and a stormy wind shall rend it. Uh, Ezekiel 38. Notice what God says here. I will plead against him, which is Gog, with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him. Number one, an overflowing rain. Um, Kenya. This past month has experienced torrential rains. More than usual. And uh, there was a man that... Um, I saw, a, uh, I've mentioned it to you, a video of him. He's a man from Kenya. He lost his son. He lost his life. He lost all of his goats. They were all washed away in the flood. And he's saying on camera, he said, I know God said that he wouldn't destroy the earth with floods anymore. Well, I would say to this man, he's not. Just because floods come locally doesn't mean that God's word is not true. God said he wouldn't destroy the earth with a flood of water. There are going to be floods. And this man experienced it. But then he followed up by saying, God caused it to stop raining right in time for me able to find my son's body. And he saw that as a little bit of grace upon his life and and I just felt sorry for the man. I'm telling everybody to pray for him. But anyway, overflowing rain, great hailstones. Notice this, fire and brimstone. Just like Egypt. Just like Sodom and Gomorrah. And God said, thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself. And I will be known in the eyes of many nations. 
What did I tell you before church? I said, I believe there will come a time when Jesus Christ will reveal himself to the entire world. The Jews are going to know who he is. Everybody on the earth who's been worshiping and following the Antichrist, thinking that he's Christ, Jesus is going to make himself known to everybody in the world. And I think most everybody in the world is going to reject Christ appearing and revealing himself. And they're going to be angry and they're going to keep worshiping the Antichrist. And then God just says, okay, I'm going to pour out vials of wrath on you. You're going to wish you had never been born. Thus will I magnify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. They shall know, look at that, they shall know that I am the Lord. Psalm 11, he said, upon the wicked he shall rain snares, he shall rain fire and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. There are two cups referenced in the Bible. There is the cup of salvation that Jesus offers to all mankind. We symbolize that cup when we take our communion. By the way, um, I'm going to call an audible here. Um, I'm moving back the Sunday morning that we're going to do communion. Uh, I had, I had uh, scheduled it. Steve and Jenny are wanting to come, come down and be part of that. And uh, I picked the wrong date. So it'll be... Huh? It'd be June 2nd? June 2nd. Okay? Everybody jot that down in your calendar and I'll have Rose uh, change it into bulletin and so on. But June 2nd is when we're going to do that, all right? Uh, but anyway, this shall be the portion of their cup. Two cups in the Bible. There's the cup of Christ, which we drink from, and the cup of devils. When I was doing the study on the Da Vinci Code, that became very evident to me. The Da Vinci Code was about the alleged cup that Jesus drank out of at the Last Supper. And if you watch like Indiana Jones and the Holy Grail then it made you think that if you drank from that cup, you would have everlasting life. It doesn't work that way. I don't care if they come up with a cup that had that Jesus' own name on it. Jesus wrote under, this is my cup, Peter, keep your hands off. Okay? I don't care if, if that's what they come up with and say, this, we found it, this is Jesus' cup right here. If you drink from this, you, that's not salvation. Don't fall for that. Don't fall for that. The cup that we drink from, we drink with our soul. It is drinking in the Word of God, the wine of the Word of God. Uh, anyway, this shall be the portion of their cup. It's the cup of devils. Psalm 105, 32, he gave them hail for rain. And I want you to underline this passage, flaming fire. Flaming fire. Trust me. No, don't trust me. Yeah, don't trust me. I drink from a sippy cup. Flaming fire. Okay? Those of you at home, get your King James Pure Bible Search software out. Type in flaming fire. Okay? Um, you'll see, if you, if you type this in, just on Google or Yahoo or anything like that, heaven on earth. Notice that it's the joining of heaven and earth together. Okay? Now, the Bible speaks of that in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. That the iron is going to be mingled with miry clay. That miry clay is of the earth, the iron is of the heavens. And they're going to mingle themselves, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But clay and iron cannot be joined together. They won't last. It's like building with untempered mortar. It'll hold for a while, but won't stay. So whether he's talking about untempered mortar 
or this, this idea of iron mingled with miry clay, it all speaks of a temporary, a temporary false security. It is a quote unquote salvation that God says over and over, it won't last. Therefore, it's not from me. Salvation, real salvation lasts. Amen. It changes the people who are saved by it and it lasts. It endures like this Bible endures. Amen. Now, turn to Revelation 8. Oh, here we go. Here's just very quickly. I got to run through these. This is the, uh, the trumpet sound in the last days. The trumpet sounding. If you look in verse 7. Finally. The first angel sounded and there followed hail and fire. There it is. Mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth. That's two of the plagues that fell on Egypt. Blood and hail and fire. And they were cast upon the earth and the third part of the trees was burnt up. And all the green grass was burned up. And what you'll notice in these trumpet judgments is the percentage of the third. The third of the trees, the third of the waters, the third of the men, and so on and so on. Um, do this as kind of a little side study if you are bored and want something to look into. Find three things in the Bible and you'll often see that two of them uh, go to heaven. The third one doesn't. So I'll give you three names. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Two of them are blessed, but one of them is cursed. Think of um, spirit, soul, and body. Two of them with salvation are blessed. Spirit and soul. What happens to the body? Ain't going nowhere. Thief on the right, thief on the left, the Savior in the middle. Three crosses. Two of them are going to paradise that day. What about the third one? Ain't going nowhere but down. Okay, he's cursed. And take the angels of heaven. A third of them cast down to the earth. Two thirds remain in heaven. Okay, so it's just, I don't know, just kind of take that through the Bible. All right. Uh, let's see here. Verse 8. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. There's a third part. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of waters. So a third of the rivers and a third of the water, the fountains that are underneath, the well waters, the springs, they... What was that? Oh, I thought it was, I thought, I sounded like it was up on stage. I thought it was something of mine. Anyway. <laughs> Alicia's like, it's uh, my phone. <laughs> um, the name of the star is called Wormwood and the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Uh, apparently, not only are they made bitter, but wormwood is an intoxicant. It's called absinthe. And uh, there's actually a, a bitter liquor made from uh, this, I think it's like a fungus that, that grows. I may be wrong, but anyway, um, it's, it's, a, it's an intoxicant and too much of it, it will kill you. Many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Now in Daniel chapter 3, notice this. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits, that's 60, 
the breadth thereof six cubits. So this image of gold, because of the numbers here, 60 and 6, that is going to be a, that's a foreshadow of Revelation 13, the image of the beast that the false prophet causes the people of the earth to make, and they make it. And, you know, from that comes the number of the beast, which is 603 score and 6. So this is a, this is a sort of a prophecy of that. A foreshadowing of it. And if you look down uh, in this same chapter, I'm not going to read all of this, but look at verse 6. There is a, a call that went out and said, when, the, when all this music sounds, if you, uh, verse 6, whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, at that time when all the people heard the sound of the all kinds of music and so on, that uh, all the people, the nations, the languages fell down and worshiped the golden image. So right here in this picture, you have number one, the image of the beast. Number two, you have a falling away taking place. And just, and I love this picture. I picture this in my mind. Every time I, every time I read this, I see like a million people out in the plain of Dura and the music sounds and Everybody falls to the ground. And it's real easy then to, fit, to pick out who's not on Nebuchadnezzar's side. All you got to do is go, oh, that's easy. It's those three guys right there. And so in the last days, I believe it's going to be that easy. Right now, you you know, run into people... Uh, on Facebook and they say they're Christian and so okay, amen, praise the Lord, you know. After a while, you start seeing some of the stuff that they do and some of the things they're a part of, some of the language that they use and so on and so on and then you go, hmm, you know, I'm not going to judge this person but I don't know, that's just not my idea of Christianity, okay? Uh, there's going to come a time when the falling away takes place. God's people will not fall. Even those with feeble knees, God is going to strengthen the feeble knees, he said. And having done all to stand, stand therefore. Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ had made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. All through the Bible we're told to stand, to stand, to stand, to stand. Here they're falling down and God's people are going to be known because they're the ones that are standing. Now, what happens to God's people for that stand? Okay, it's one thing to say, I'm going to take a stand for God. But what happens is sometimes people take that stand and then they don't like uh, the wrath of this world coming down on them. Maybe they might lose their job or maybe all their friends and family walks out on them and they kind of get upset and, and say, well, you know, that's not supposed to happen. I took a stand for God. He should bless me. Listen, God is going to bless you, but you're got to learn that in this world, living under the reign of sleepy, nasty, dirty Joe, that... Taking a stand for Christ is not going to get you in favor with all the quote-unquote woke people in this world. Amen? Um, there is a wrath that this world will pour out upon those who take a stand for Jesus Christ. And the world's not going to like you and they're going to hate you. And uh, you might as well get used to that. You might as well get ready for it. Don't, don't worry about taking blessings down here on earth. God's got plenty for you in heaven. Amen. So, now notice this. The furnace. Proverbs 17, 3. The fining pot, and it means refining. The fining pot is for silver. And the furnace for gold. But the Lord trieth the heart's. Notice this. So the silver is refined practically the same way gold is. And so it's kind of putting those two together. The refinery refines silver. 
and the refinery has a furnace in it, so it'll, it'll try silver and it'll try gold, and it'll refine it, purify it, and you take, you know, scrape the scum off the top, and now you have almost pure silver. But when it comes to the hearts of man, the Lord's going to do that. And don't think that because you've lived a life for God for so many years and you've dedicated your life and your family to the Lord and you've been faithful to church, you've been faithful to read your Bible, you've been faithful to tithe, you've been faithful to witness, you've said amen at all the right parts in the sermon. And But don't think that God won't try you. Because one of the things that God tries in us is our motives. All those years you went to church, all those years you studied the Bible, all, those, all that money you gave to the church, was you doing that so that you could be seen as somebody who looks like a good Christian? Or was you truly doing that because you love the Lord and you love what He's done for you? And you don't care what the consequences are. This is what I'm going to do for God. See, Jesus said in the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart. Which has to do with our motives. Why we do what we do. And believe it or not, I, I've seen people and known people. That their church attendance and their uh, saying amen in the sermons. All of that was to make them look good in men's eyes. And believe it or not, some people just thrive on that. They take it in. Oh, I, you know, I'm, I'm known in our church. Okay, but let God try your heart and see what's really in it. And if you're in it for yourself, God has no place for you in his kingdom. Say amen to that. The Lord trieth the hearts. <clears throat> Proverbs 27, <clears throat> 21. As the fining pot for silver and the furnace of gold. See, it looks like it's the same verse, doesn't it? So is a man to his praise. There again, the Lord is going to try us to see whether or not what we're doing is for our praise or is it for God's glory. So now Psalm 12, the words of the, now we've mentioned a fining pot for silver, furnace for gold. And here we have the same thing. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth. So let's, let's think about this for a minute. When they made furnaces back then, they made them out of brick, fire brick. That material, they didn't pick it out of the cloud somewhere. It didn't grow on trees. They dug it up out of the earth. So literally any furnace that they use for refining metals and so on was a furnace of earth. The meaning of it in this verse is that number one, the word of God is tried in this world and refined and made pure down here. And this is important because I, I in, in all the arguments where people uh, tried to give me why I was wrong about believing this Bible and believing that everything in it was right, I would say, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And they would retort back and say, well, uh, yeah, in heaven it's perfect, but not down here. Er, hold on. Psalm 12. The words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of what? Earth. Down here. So, let me give you a very quick uh, English Bible history lesson. Uh, there were Bibles before the King James in English. You go back to Wycliffe's Bible. Uh, he was a Roman Catholic priest that saw the abuses of the church and the priesthood. And he said, oh, if God's people just had a copy of the Bible in their own language, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be pulled into these false doctrines by these priests. They would understand that their salvation doesn't come by how much money they give to the priest or letting him take 
whole houses, widows' houses, and farms and cattle and everything else to enrich himself, they would understand that their salvation comes from God, not the church. And so he went about to translate the Bible from the only thing that he had, which was the Latin Bible. And he did a pretty good job of it. And what he wasn't able to finish in his lifetime, they finished for him, his disciples finished for him. But anyway, it was the idea of getting the people the Bible in English, because all they ever heard was the Bible was read in Latin, and no one gave an interpretation. So all the people would go to the Catholic Church, and they would hear all this Latin stuff, and they were going, I guess that's God's Word, I don't know. And then these priests would go after them, go after their children, go after their daughter, or their wife, or whatever, and say, well, this is what God wants. But now, so Wycliffe's Bible, and I don't know all of the ones in between there, but you have Wycliffe's Bible, uh, you had later on, you, of course, you had the, um, the Bishop's Bible, which was used in the Church of England, 1500s, and you had the uh, Geneva Bible, which was translated by the Puritan believers in Geneva, Switzerland, that's why they call it that, but the Geneva Bible had some problems. The, because the Puritans despised the throne of any nation, they didn't feel like no man had a right to be a king over any people. Well, that's not what the Bible says. But that's what they believed. And so they would, they would translate the Bible leaning in that direction. And what they just, you know, couldn't just translate it wrongly just to prove their point. They wrote all these notes in the margin and told people what to believe and how to believe what these verses said. They even added a phrase in Ephesians chapter 6, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against uh, earthly rulers or something. They added that in there, that, they're, that you are a, a, a Christian fighting against uh, the rights of kings in this world. But the, the Bible doesn't say that. And so when King James of England came along, he knew that was in the Geneva Bible. He knew that he had Church of England and he had Puritans in his kingdom. And, he, and God laid it on his heart, I believe, to where he wanted a united kingdom. Even if they're going to have two different religions, let's give them one Bible. And so he gathered together Puritan scholars, Church of England scholars, and put them all together together. And they brought about the absolute best book ever in the English language, bar none. This Bible has done more for the kingdom of God than any other single translation of the Bible in earth's history. Aside from, well, the Ten Commandments weren't a translation, but that's just a general history of the English Bible. Took them seven years to do it. Let's read this verse again. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. They passed that Bible translation around amongst those scholars. For seven years, they refined the words of that Bible. To make sure that all of the words... Number one, to make sure they were true to the Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Number two, and this is something that the King James haters use as a... The King James is wrong because it does this. It plainly says on many of the King James uh, opening page, with the former translations diligently compared and revised. They took... Luther's German Bible, they took the Latin Bible, they took Bibles that they had in other languages and they compared what they said to what they translated because they thought, well, Peter said that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, translation. And so they said, if it says it in French and it says it in Latin and it says it in German, then it must say it in English. That way, the Bible is the same no matter where you go. Whew, I'm getting doodads. So they purified this Bible. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So the Bible went through the fiery furnace 
as it were, and was refined here on this earth. Now, uh, look at Isaiah 48. God said, um, verse 10, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. For mine own sake, even for mine own sake, will I do it. For how should my name be polluted, and I will not give my glory unto another. So, he mentions here in Jeremiah 11, um, he says, he mentions the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt from the iron furnace. Well, there's something to think about in your iron kingdom, Daniel chapter 2. He mentioned that it was the land of Egypt. But he pulled them out of the iron furnace because that was to refine them. That's why God left them in bondage. And then he says, saying, obey my voice and do them according to all which I command you. So you shall be my people. Now, uh, I want to get to this. Turn to these places in your Bible with me. Psalm 105, Psalm 104. And this is a little word study. Remember, we came across this phrase, flaming fire. Where? Where did we see it? Ah, Psalm 105. He gave them hail for rain and flaming fire in their land. So, we go back to Psalm 105. He gave them hail for rain and flaming fire in their land. Then, in Psalm 104, he's going to identify what the flaming fire is. Who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. Same phrase. And this is what I like. This is really the sort of the, the first real big thing that God, uh, that God taught me way back 1998, 1999 was because I believed this one English translation translated out of three different languages that I mean, I only studied one that was Greek. Out of these three different languages, if you left them in their original languages, you wouldn't make the connections that an, a singular translation would have built into it. So, when God brought this Bible together, from three different languages into one language, English. He's now tying together all of the connections. It's like plugging in a new computer. You got to put everything in the right place. You got to plug the mouse in here, keyboard in here. You got to plug the monitor in there and the network and this and that. And you have the printer and all of that stuff. You got to all put it in its right place. And once you get it all together, that thing's going to purr like a kitten. So here he's telling you, flaming fire are those angels. That's what they're made of. And he verifies that by telling us stories about, you know, the, the chariots of fire and horses of fire that, you know, surrounded Elisha and his servant. Now turn to Second Thessalonians. And we're, this is, we're going to stop here tonight. But 2 Thessalonians. So, that flaming fire that God said He's going to send to this world, what is it? What is it? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. We're bound to thank God always for you, Brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. The Bible's very plainly telling us 
that when God takes us through persecutions and tribulations, even now in our life, what he's doing is that he is qualifying us to be in God's kingdom. Did Christ become part of God's kingdom without affliction? No. They beat him. They plucked his beard off. They punched him in the face. They laid a cross on him. They drug him to Calvary. They nailed him there. He suffered for hours and hours and hours on that cross, uh, choking to death in his own fluid surrounding his lungs and his heart until he could no longer breathe and he gave up the ghost and he suffered. But after that, how much suffering did he do? It's over with. So God is telling us that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Seeing it as a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. So yeah, there are going to be people that trouble us. There are going to be people that persecute us. There are going to be people that cause us to suffer great harm. But don't worry. God's not going to let anybody get away with it. None of them. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming... It's the same phrase. See, that's what I was getting at. If you, if you maintain that the only correct Bible would be the Greek and the Hebrew in the Aramaic, you probably would never make this linguistic connection of the phrase flaming fire. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what, is God, what does it look like God's going to do? It looks like to all of those who persecute God's people, God's written their name down and he's reserved a horrible fate for them. And when it's time, when the Lord is revealed in heaven, God is sending flaming fire down from heaven on them. Just like he did Sodom and Gomorrah. Just like he did Egypt. Just like he did the, uh, the hail and the fire that falls down on the walls built with untempered mortar. God is going to send that down. And what, what is that flaming fire? Well, we just found out that it was a group of angels. Flaming fire. And there we have in Revelation 12, a third. There's that third of the angels, Chris, that are cast down out of heaven. That's your firestorm right there. Revelation 6, the same thing. Revelation 12, there it is. That's the firestorm. That's the hail mingled with fire that comes down from heaven onto the earth. Revelation 8 and the trumpet judgments. Okay? Now you take that and say, God, is Mike Hoggard crazy? And God will say, yes. But maybe with this one, he's not. All right. That's enough for tonight.